Good afternoon, evening. This is the NBR Review Committee. Today is the 31st of May, 2017, and my name is still Margaret Mano. So our first item is uh, to see if we have any public comment. Do we have any public comment? George? I'm, I'm just here as you know, spectator to listen. Well, welcome and thank you for coming. Um, Michael, do you want to say anything? Not at this time. Okay. All righty. So um, next we should. We we just had public comment. If you wanted to make any comments. I want to listen to see what we got. Okay. I have a project for uh, the Isaac building. Okay, we're working on putting those ideas together. We're still in a kind of discussion phase. Okay. Um, we have had some uh, things that we voted on that we're going to move forward on, but we're still sort of in the early stages of determining what we're going to do. So uh, thank you for coming. Okay. Uh, any more public comment? Okay, so let's uh, have a look at the minutes. Um, did anyone have any comments on the minutes or errors, additions, subtractions? Motion we approve the minutes. Um, second. Yeah. Second. Aye. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And then it's passed. So. <coughs> okay. Again, if somebody would like to just scratch down some notes yes. for me, it's really helpful um, <coughs> for me to remember what I said. Okay. So I'm going to actually um, move the minutes around a bit. Um, because um, I want to just talk about the parking requirements first because uh, I said I would go back and um, look at various things to do with the parking because we were discussing exactly what the minimum should be. So I, I did some... ...like uh, the town of Lloyd Gateway District, which you all got in your packets, but I pulled out the parking requirements. And also um, the village of Rhinebeck, which has also been used as an example of a community we might want to aspire to be like. Um, so um, I'll talk about their parking requirements. So um, there's a handout here that well, there's one for Brian back there that's more complete than this other one. Um, so that's Brian back, and this is Lloyd Gateway. Back to everybody. That's Lloyd. If there's any extra, we can share those with the public. All right, don't take that one away, because that's, uh, that's the last of the Rhinebacks. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, there's some more Rhinebacks over here. Okay, so when it comes to residential uses for multi-family dwellings, which is really what we're looking at here, right? Uh, let's look at Rhinebeck first. So, um, for... Rhinebeck multifamily and um, what have we got? What have we got there? Okay, dwelling multifamily is two per unit, which was higher than what we came up with. We were looking at one or one and a half. So Rhinebeck is kind of at the top end of two per unit for multifamily, and for. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but. It also says that apartments are one for each. 
I know. apartment. So, is a multifamily... I think that might yeah, are be they like, about a, like a multifamily house. I think they're thinking of like an accessory apartment, maybe, um, because for multifamily here, they've got two per unit, because then you might have more than one bedroom, right? So yeah, that you know, there's there's so many confusing things in zoning regulations, you have to go into right. the definitions. Because right. like I'm thinking about, uh, you know, and well, none of what we're doing applies to zero place. Is that considered a multifamily dwelling or? Yeah. No yes. Yes. He made that okay. very clear that that was a. That's a multifamily multi dwelling. Mm -hmm. So an apartment could be an accessory apartment, or, you know, sort of. Right. There's a wide variety of apartments. Mm -hmm. So that's two, and for retail businesses. Retail and service business, they have one per 2,000 maximum, that's square feet. And it says to 1,000 minimum. In other words, you gotta have like at least five spaces. That's how I interpret that. So that is, you know, pretty, um, that's pretty generous. Uh, zero place has, um, one per unit, I guess, and also one for 500 square feet. Okay, so if we look at the town of Lloyd for um, single family, no, not single family. Uh, you, don't, you don't have that because I didn't discover it till later. You only have the second bit of that. Um, it's, um, all other resident, well, single family dwelling has two per dwelling unit. All other residential uses, one and a half for each dwelling unit with one bedroom, two for each dwelling unit with two or more bedrooms. So that was kind of the number we were dealing with by the end of our discussion. So, and, and those are kind of two ends of the spectrum. The NBR at the moment is on the very, very low end in terms of either residential for multifamily or for business. How does handicap parking uh, fit into all of this? Is that above and beyond these requirements or is that included in these requirements? Handicap parking is a ratio right. of, the, of the spaces required. So it's included in it's included, it's not additional parking spaces, but you have to have so many of those right. spaces per hundred. Joe, can I speak to uh, the retail use? Yeah. Um, I know uh, right back they have a, you know, one space based on, you know, spaces based on square footage. I think we should look at um, a minimum of one space per, per retail business plus a certain amount of par uh, parking per square foot. Right. You're always going to have employee parking, and you're going to have an employee there no matter how it's a big size. You need at least something. So I don't know. Um, like you could have, and I know they say one per 200 max, then it says up to you know 1,000 minimum. So maybe it's a, it's a sliding mm -hmm. scale on that. But it, I think we should have at least one per business plus X number of spots per square footage. Because one could break it up into a lot of little shops. Yeah. Obviously, the load would be a lot higher than if it was just one big shop. I, I think. But, yeah. Uh, just because you got a factory employees and maybe. Uh, and there's always a problem, you know, with the owner or the the person who's running the business parking, you know, and taking up one of the spots that you want your customers to have. I know that one of the issues on Main Street is that, you know, for a long time the business owners were parking on Main Street. I think now they have to move, but um, that's a big issue. And, and so that's a very good idea, Floyd. Thank you for that. So those are numbers that I said I would go look for. So um, probably the one and a half per multifamily unit and two for each dwelling unit with two or more bedrooms seems like a, a fairly good um, metric to play with and then um, we need to consider what's a, a good square footage. Floyd, do you have any ideas on 
sort of a, of a middle ground, one per... Um, for, for the retail? For, yeah. Or just for the Per retail unit, right? No, I mean, I, the, the 200 seems appropriate if they're smaller. Yeah. So I guess you could have a sliding scale and leave it to the planning board to make yeah, a decision. Yeah, to adjust accordingly. Now a lot of them do allow, allow um, a reduction factor if you have residential right. and retail. Um, so that's why I gave you that other piece of paper, um, the town Lloyd um, parking stuff, mm -hmm. um, because it has there's a there's a diagram that everybody uses, which is, sh is shared parking. So um, those are factors. So that if you have um, if you have residential, multifamily residential with stores on the bottom, or offices, which is what we're doing in the NBR, um, then you have a parking factor. So if your metric meant you had to have um, so many parking spaces. You divide it by that number, and that that gives you yeah, like a reduction. Yeah. And this is widely used. Yeah, no, that, that's pretty neat. And, and actually, if you see the reason why, you know, the residential and office, they're usually considered to be, you know, offices are typical office hours, nine to five, whereas retail may swing over into the uh, rush hour period, thus five to seven. So that's why the factor is low, a higher reduction factor for offices and residential that than for sense. retail and residential, because retail slides mm -hmm. in the evening. I certainly see that down here where our office buildings, we have a mix, and the tenants are able to use it at night and on the weekends. So. Mm -hmm. It's a problem with some, many communities that, you know, they're basically vacant, like City of Poughkeepsie, Market Street area is dead man zone after five because of all the county office buildings and the other office buildings in the area, it's just empty after fire. So in that way, it's a, it is good to have some mix because then it does allow you to take advantage of that. Um, the other thing I had seen, you know, one thing to point out with Rhinebeck is even though they have a fairly high parking requirement, they also have a significant number of public parking lots. Yeah. And they actually allow you to pay into a public parking fund instead of building your own sites. Um, that's then used for maintenance and expansion of the public lots. Um, but we really don't have that opportunity, at least not yet, in the MBR zone, because there really is no public parking. Yeah, and so once they tear down the town hall, there'll be lots of public parking. Was, <laughs> well, unless they put something else in place, you know. So. Yeah. Um, what is going to happen with that? Well, we do have more yellow pool. Uh, I mean, yeah, but then that's then used that, for the summer. <coughs> that, that has critical periods. I know, hard. but it's unfortunate because it's a big parking space right there. I, there's a, an agreement with the Swimming Associate. Is that right? It's not just a straight park? Is it? Is the pool, is there an agreement with the swimming? It's a straight group? park. Okay, but the park, I thought the parking was reserved for like swimming pool uses basically or there was something with the agreement, there was something in the agreement that really designated that not just as public parking. Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware, okay. I mean, if, if there, like uh, Joe Bennett said, if they're a critical mass, you know, during the summer when they're open, so there is no additional parking. And, and when they have uh, swim meets, yes, but that's typically nights or. Uh, Mostly weekends. It's designated parkland, so the parking lot is for parkland. Okay. Okay. Who maintains the parking? I'm just wondering, is it plowed in the winter? This is the, big, the biggest question. I think it is plowed in the winter, but the town uh, highway department maintains that property. Okay. So if we were interested in that as a public parking lot, then we'd have to. We'll do some more research on that. Yeah, I, but. To your point, like how does how can you use that area? Because in the summer, it's totally huge every hour. Yeah, and you can just imagine if people get used to using that parking lot the rest of the year, and then all of a sudden the pool opens. It's gonna well, be and I think that's what happened during the DUS SO meets. That they 
use the park and ride extensively. And then when that got closed off, they were kind of all over the place. Okay. Yeah. They use uh, the L park around the Mulberry Square apartments. Yeah. <coughs> but back then, the requirement, I think, was uh, when we built that, was two units per apartment. Two spaces per unit. Which we have plenty of parking. Mm -hmm. Too much parking. Yeah, you have too much parking. parking in there. How many bedrooms are those units? They're all two bedroom units. It's 56 units, all two bedrooms. I think how they used to do it was, it was one spot and then a half a spot per bedroom or something like that. So when it's two bedroom, we round up to two. But I think even if it was a three bedroom, it would be two. Yes. That's how they did it. That's how they had to round up for each one. Yeah, two, two seems, do you, do you see that you have a lot of empty spaces all the time? Quite a bit. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, one and a half to me would seem appropriate. But yes. Okay. And well, then over two bedrooms, you go. Two? Yeah. Maybe one for the first bedroom and then half per additional bedroom. Well, but I think any time you get above three bedrooms, you know, really not any longer of an apartment. You know, more of a yeah. rooming, rooming yeah. situation. Yeah, and unless you, and then you go to students, yeah. they're going to have cars. If you have a parent that has several children taking the same apartment, they may only have one car or even none. So. Mm -hmm. Well, they probably have two cars. Okay, so we're still doing research on that. We will not make any votes right now, but you know we're leaning towards one and a half per unit in uh, residential units and using a, a metric, um, a sliding scale for the retail plus at least one for the owner uh, or business manager or whatever. Are, are we restricting the use? I think right now it just says business uses in the current zoning. Yeah. It doesn't identify. I mean, I always pictured it as retail there. Retail, I think says, office. I mean, actually, what it says is that for general retail, yeah. you have one per 5,000 square feet, or 500 square feet. But, any of the uses that have parking regulations in the rest of the in the rest of the, the, the village, yeah. like restaurants, sure, sure, the same parking requirements require in the NBR as in the other areas. So they so, only identified retail to give them a bonus. So it's speak. just commercial uses. If you uses. go to a restaurant, it's one. I think one per three seats. Yeah. In so, the restaurant. So not that I'm trying to change the topic to uses, but we only discussed retail as relates to parking. Should we discuss other business use, commercial uses, or are we envisioning good question or limiting the the types of uses? Because right now it's not limited. It just says, it basically just says commercial, right? Just says commercial. Yeah. And, and then what? It, but what it says is that you have to have a special use permit for That's any good. particular use. And then with that special use permit, when you name that use, the parking requirements that go with that use apply. Okay. So it's the same as for the rest of the village for sure. restaurants or anything like that, where it's a, not a general retail. But it allows any business use. But it they're says all commercial, it, at the moment the NBR has um, parking guidelines, A, residential uses 0.5 space per bedroom, and B, commercial uses, one space for every 500 feet of net interior floor space. I think we should, uh, for the residential part, it should, so if it's 0.5 per bedroom, do they have to round up per apartment? Or are they saying 20 apartment, 21 bedroom apartments is 10 spaces? I think it's just per bedroom. That's what it says. In so the, if there's 20 bedrooms in the place. That's the way it was, the way it was applied for zero place, which is the only example we have, right, right. is that one bedroom apartments only required half a space. Yes, yes. And that two bedroom apartments required one space. I think that's unrealistic. I think there I, should I, be a roundup. There should be a rounding going on, like, oh, or something. I don't mind the combining, but I just think yes. the overall number is too Right. Big. Right, so, I would say come up with a number and then do the, the factor to combine for shared base spaces and then 
and then you then you wrap. I, I think. I mean, I think we'd be unrealistic to say a one-bedroom apartment, the person's not going to own a car. I mean, or every other person's going to have a car. Yeah. I don't know, but then, then again, how many one-bedroom apartments are going to be built? Cause it seems like two bedrooms are much more popular. Yeah, and I, I think the, the goal was to encourage, yeah. limit the number of parking, but you have to respond to demand, not necessarily right, goal. Yeah, right, right. And also that the other... You know, as the district grows and maybe there are more parking lots or there are more more transit, you know, more um, the, the bike lanes are there, the sidewalks are there, then we could see about limiting parking numbers, you know, bringing them back down a little. Right. But to go with the raw space that we have now and have that low of a parking number, I think, is just unrealistic. And then certainly reducing the number of parking spaces helps whoever's developing the property to, to not have the need to go as many floors, which is what we're concerned about, having floors above three. So allowing less parking spaces allows them to have more square footage to work with as a footprint, which potentially very much. Unfortunately, it really goes, it's a two-edged sword. Yeah, it's because, true. you know, zero places, the four, and it makes it a smaller building with more floor right. space good point. and and then more room to provide more parking. Right. So it's a really a double-edged sword. When you have this type of district where so much is left up to site plan and special use permit, you know, it, it, it's hard to really look at what's gonna happen, you know, with the parking lot numbers and with the right. the spaces, all we can do is try and provide what we think is right. And then the buildings will have to be adjusted based on that. Just, just one other quick thing about um, having to follow the special use uh, guidelines. My memory uh, is correct. Not all uses have special uh, use guidelines. There's like a, the general and then there's specific. So not many of them have specific ones. Most of the time it's general. Especially if currently they're mostly principally permitted uses. They're not going to have anything. At the moment, there are no principal permitted uses. That's no, I'm just saying in, NBR, in, yeah, in the, overall, in the, in the yeah. overall code. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like there might be a yeah. retail may never be special. I mean, I don't know. I well, guess well I think the, the code in general tried to say, you know, uses that we don't think are requiring more than the average number of spaces, we just leave in retail. But if it's a specific use, like a restaurant where there can be a real expectation of a certain number of people based on your number of tables. Um, it makes a lot of sense to have a, yeah. a special parking standard just for that. Yeah. Okay, so we will revisit this because it's a, it's a tricky number and also we need to look at, you know, the uses and maybe circle back through that. So, um, I did some homework. I'll keep doing more homework. I'll find out about Mario or Pool and how that relates to things. Um, and yeah, we'll and I, I looked at making recommendations. some of the other villages in Dutch, just like the Village of Fishkill and the Village of Millbrook. And, you know, it was really all over the place. Millbrook was two per unit, I think, and plus more for a bedroom. So you know, it was really hot. Whereas Fishco was a little lower because I think they're used to more the multi-family units. Mm -hmm. But I believe that a lot of them do do one per unit and then plus four bedrooms for each bedroom or additional bedrooms over one. Okay, I think we all agree that 0.5 of a bedroom is too low though. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, I'd really like to talk about setbacks and then we can go look at the Behan um, draft. Um, but in the light of that, um, number six. Um, number six is uh, something I sent you all um, at the very beginning of our um, research into this, um, I sent you all the town of Lloyd Walkway District, mm -hmm. district regulations, and uh, we will be 
revisiting that again um, as we move forward as a, a useful um, template for what we might do because um, that was actually suggested by Dennis Doyle and the Ulster County Planning Board when um, the NBR was initially submitted to them um, in October 2015. And, and this is um, the Ulster County Planning Board recommendation. I've probably sent this to you before, but um, it's part of a redacted packet and agenda with the village board um, public records from 10 28 So um, it includes the discussion uh, supporting the idea of a mixed-use corridor and um, the idea of uh, all the permitted land use is going through the special permitting process, they point out that um, that's kind of burdensome for the planning board, which we found out. Um, and it says uh, the UCPB recommends the village utilize a review process that's less onerous to developers by changing some permitted uses into principally permitted ones and only subject to site plan review. And if you turn over the second page, it says the Ulster County Planning Board also supports as a means of adding transparency and clearly identifying desired outcomes for the district to village officials, residents, and developers alike, the future development of a form-based code for the district, if not the entire village. So, um, and it suggests under form-based code, the village of New Spots should consider developing a form-based code. The example from the town of Lloyd and their walkway gateway the zoning district is attached. So um, we'll be revisiting that. And the person who suggested that um, we should ask Dennis Doyle what he thought about um, what we were doing, I said, well, he kind of already made that statement back in 2015. And so Bill Murray was the one who um, suggested, you know, that we um, consider that, and I said, oh yeah, well, that's been done, so good thought. So we will be um, borrowing some of the ideas as we move forward, because uh, we've run out of money for our planning consultant, so we're going to try and uh, put together our suggestions and hopefully a skeleton code and the mayor and I talked about this today. Um, so that's the, that's the way forward. Okay, so. And just so we're clear, you know, it's either, either gonna go with design guidelines or form-based zoning or. Well, we're gonna start one with. One is the, more of a, a right. more detailed, all a form-based code is really is a more detailed of design guidelines. Right. So the idea is that we'll work on the nuts and bolts of the zoning, like, height, um, parking spaces, uses, setbacks, and then we'll develop a very broad set of guidelines, maybe put back the guidelines that were eliminated in this zone, but applied to the North Gateway District. That's the village comprehensive plan guidelines, which deal with um, assessing height, mass, fenestration, um, architectural uh, details and if we're going to have an architectural review board that will be an ideal um, duty or mission for them to weigh in on, on architectural details. So those two ideas really dovetail very well. Um, so that's, uh, that was input from Bill Murray and I wanted to bring that up and say that that's where we were going to go in our midterm goal as we move forward. Uh, so, and further thinking about it too, the, the form base would be an excellent way to differentiate if we're talking about the sub-districts more than the solid end. The form base would be an excellent way to differentiate between the two sub-districts. Yeah, just uh, by way of background. The building is, you know, the buildings are 
different on the larger box? We had decided at our last meeting that was in the minutes that really we've got two different districts here. We've got the southern end of the NBR and the northern end of the NBR. Um, for the time being, we're dividing that. Um, the dividing line is tentatively at tributary 13 um, because that also kind of divides the uh, area south of that has uh, central water and sewer and only some of the properties uh, north of that from what I understand although I um, I'm going on here saying so there uh, and also the northern area has larger lots as, as it's a sort of a widening price slice that we've got um, here so have you got there's a picture all right Okay, so now we can go back to number three. Um, and that is the Behan draft. So I bought copies of the first seven pages, which is the only new stuff. So here they are. This is just the first seven pages. So uh, the seven pages were the addition that um, Michael Allen did as, by way of a summary review. Before this, we had uh, a two-page review that was just giving sort of general ideas of where we were going, and this one is developed to a much more detailed level and um, giving us the district recommendations. So it starts with looking at what the existing zoning is um, and then the second page gives us the zoning map which is always helpful to have on hand. And um, page three is where it gets into the nitty gritty. Um, on this copy, you'll see there's an erasure on the bottom of page three. This we took out before we, um, I sent it to you guys because uh, this change I made before it was finalized because the, the bit we cut out didn't make any sense. Mm. Um, and it didn't change the meaning at all. In fact, it suggested that we needed a gateway transition area that would be um, something to access the Wolke Valley Rail Trail, but we've got a street that does that. <laughs> so we don't need to make people bicycle down tributary 13. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, Route 32 uh, district recommendations. Route 32 North could be a beautiful corridor, however, currently it needs a unified vision for improvement and development of the roadway and surrounding properties to ensure that its future development is in keeping with the unique character of New Paltz and the environmental setting. So North versus South End. There is reasonable evidence and consensus that the North End of the NBR district is distinct and different from the Southern End and could therefore be treated slightly differently. This is something we had already come to as a conclusion before we got this input, so it's good that we're all um, sharing that idea. The split approach would allow different area and bulk requirements to apply to the southern end, which has tighter space constraints, constraints as well as different design standards. We would recommend this split approach be pursued either by keeping the current district in place and identifying sub-districts with specific design guidelines to regulate how the two separate areas are treated or establishing a separate zoning district for the north end. Of the two options, creating a separate district may be the cleaner and more direct option depending on how many differences are finally determined to exist between them. 
The most natural dividing line between these two districts is open for debate and perhaps for the study. However, one area stands out as the potential first option for discussion. Just north of Stewart's and the former park and ride, there's a waterway, tributary 13, which crosses, crosses uh, underneath Route 32 to Otto Narrow Bridge. The neighborhood character and development south of this bridge is generally different and would make a reasonably natural place for a transition into a slightly more urbanized district as you're approaching the village center. So that we sort of came to, right? So let's skip to the southern end because we've really focused a lot on the southern end. That's where our, and then we'll go back to the northern end or you want to do it differently. I'm just confused. <coughs> why the recommended characteristics of the northern end involve a lower height max than the northern end. Like the northern end, it says two to two and a half story, 30 to 35 feet, and it says southern end, three story, 40 feet. Yeah. Isn't the northern end where we would have more space? For yes, but I, the idea was that as you're coming in from the town of New Paltz, where you've because got there's nothing single family enough. homes that you would have a gradual transition rather than hitting the edge of the village and well you've got BOCES there right now and BOCES is likely to stay there. Mm -hmm. So that's you know a one story with a roof and so um, having two and a half stories rather than three would mean you could have a gradual Increase, but again, that's up for discussion. These yeah, are. I, I don't agree with that. Oh uh, yeah, I don't either. Actually. Yeah, I, I really. Um, I, I think that I think you're right. I think the, that end, the parcels. Can we start with the north end? <laughs> okay, let's we start with the north end. We have concerns with that. <laughs> I think in just reading it, it did strike me as a little off. I mean, we were talking earlier that the parcels down at that end actually you know had more room for right. a larger building and um i think i think it was clear that people are in general consensus was four is right out but i think three especially if you have larger setbacks in the front mm -hmm. and in the back and the building is they're not right up against right. the road they'll achieve achieve the same effect but it'll still allow three stories Right. And that I think I think there is some difference in the streetscape in that area. I don't know whether we'd want to allow on street parking that far down. Well, if you see number five, it says no on street parking. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I agree with that. But with that no on street parking, then the idea of a storefront really kind of loses its appeal for me. Uh, if you don't have that complete street with a slower speed, then why are you forcing buildings up to the front line well, and trying to create that storefront look? Well, the next thing addresses that larger front yard setbacks would be preferred and could be accommodated here due to the larger lot depth. And I agree with that, mm -hmm. but doesn't that also then give us some room for three-story, but you know, as long as you can center the building more, further away from the rail trail, further away from the road, then you know, I don't see the problem with the three-story. Other comments? I concur with that. Yeah, I, I, I think I concur. The only comment I would have is that some of the public was concerned about the, the general viewscape. <laughs> Um, and people that are in the residential areas, in the residential houses there, were feeling a little intimidated by being in a one, two-story house and, you know, being up against a big block of a three-story building uh, right next door. I think that's where, again, for a larger front setback and aren't that many residential parcels that are directly facing 32, right? They're more on south Well, street. there are a few. There's a few. Yeah, there's there are some. It's, 
And we had already talked about correcting the little wedge. Yeah. There. Yeah, the, yeah, the wedge the, is the wedge a no-brainer, and go. we've <laughs> already come to that. We've come to that understanding that that does not belong in the NBR zone, nor do those three houses. Oh, right, right. right. So yeah. we're going back to that. I think if, we, oh. if like you this. take out that wedge and those three houses, that might satisfy some of those concerns. Because the next yeah. housing down is actually the ballet studio. Right. And then, and then right. my market, and then the, the apartments. I, I the apartments be, are set a little low. Right. I would be much more comfortable if we if we knew for sure that we could take out that wedge okay. on both Yeah, sides. I think we've all agreed and we voted on that last yeah. time okay. and it's in the minutes and okay. people are aware of that. I don't know how that got in there, but... Um, I think it just was to meet the village boundary. Yeah. Okay, so three stories and consistent with the, the southern end instead of that recommendation. Larger front yard setbacks. Um, we've got to get down to the nitty gritty at some point would be preferred and can be accommodated here due to the larger lot depth. So that makes sense, mm -hmm. I think. And then we're talking about a landscape. Scape. Required landscape front, front lawn area with sidewalk and planting strip between sidewalk and lawn. Again, that buffer is a the, mm -hmm. Okay. Some limited convenience parking should be allowed in the front yard with low landscape screening. However, the remainder of the parking would be required in the side or rear. That concerns me a little. Um, I'm trying to envision that. Again, what I was thinking on that was it just gets the building a little bit further off the road. So, you know, you're just coming into this new zone, you're entering the village, you see that the buildings are taller, but they're set back a bit. And so as long as you have that landscape strip, then if you have a row of parking, it's, again, it just further sets back the building. And I don't have problems with that person. Uh, so, sort of related to that, uh, on the north end, and I don't see it listed, um, I think we should require some interconnecting so people don't have to go out on the road and then turn back in if they want to go from one shop to the next. And that oh, might yeah. work with the side parking lots. So we would have some coordination, you know, if someone wanted to be on the left side, the next property probably wanted to be on the right side so it would be easy to connect. So we might want to put some kind of language I think to that. that's... Um addressed um, okay, I didn't see shared, shared parking um, okay. shared access is addressed a little bit later okay and that that makes total yeah, sense definitely on the north end for sure yeah, so to reduce the curb cuts and you know shared um, access between adjacent properties if possible to minimize the curb cut and um, the existing zoning allows a zero side lot line if you're doing adjacent parking yeah. If it's two adjacent parking lots, yeah, you can go great. right to the line yeah, that sure. pretty much one. Except then, that if the property is not developed next to it, how do you make that judgment? Well, it's, yeah, it's you're really, if you're going someone, in next to an adjacent yeah. that has it, yeah. Yeah, but you also want to be able to do it. You know? that's, a, that's a good point, though, yeah. When does that come to play? Hmm. Michael has a there, question. There, we have been some work done on things like what they call parking improvement districts. Okay, so could you come up to the table and talk to a mic? Okay. Thank you, because I want to sure. engage you Sorry. in the next thing. Okay. Um, there have been developments of uh, what's called parking improvement districts where they have interconnected parking lots and they have to create like a separate entity uh, to handle the liabilities that may or may not exist. And we have right now in New Paltz, we have a substantial amount of traffic that has to go from McDonald's to now the Tops Plaza, which is no, they're right there. And so the creation of those kinds of zones can be accomplished. Uh, there's been a lot of work on that in other towns and stuff like that. And certainly we need to set some examples here. We can do it right now with the zoning and then try to backwardly do it to the rest of New Paltz. But that would be a really ideal thing to have. Uh, this is Michael Reed from the Mulkill Valley Railroad. 
and I wanted your input on our next um, item here. Um, no on-street parking. Bike lanes would be accommodated on each side of the two-lane roadway. Um, Where which, uh, this is in uh, page this is six. North End, page, page, page four. 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 Number page four. four. Five. Page four, number page five. Four. So. Um, at some point in here, it gives like the exact footage you need to have um, the bike lanes and. Yeah, that's further on. Actually, I was going to comment about that. Number yeah. sixteen. Yeah. Number sixteen on page six. And they started off with that caveat, although not within the scope of the zoning analysis, and then they jump right off the bridge. Okay. Um, they yeah. seem they seemingly eliminated the fact that uh, Route 32 is a state bike route, and that many parts of it are, in fact, eight feet in width further north uh, in Rosendale, parts of Kingston. The bike lanes. The bike. Well, the bike lane. Yes, yeah. part of that state bike route. Um, I know that DOT has been asked to take a look at a number of places right at 213 mm -hmm. where the bridge is. There's right now. There's a, a guardrail that wraps around it and completely eliminates access to the protected lane that exists adjacent to the bridge. And it's just been brought to their attention and it's, they have no answer for why it's there. And then that further, as you go north, that guardrail just goes all along and really cuts off any ability for a bicyclist to use the route or for trimming or anything to be done on the, on the side. So they've kind of eliminated their own bike route. Um, by some kind of a fencing requirement or whatever, whatever they did or why they put the guardrail there is un unknown. But um, okay. so anyway, in answer so what, to your question about, here, um, this this I thing need is. I to know if these the numbers work. Hmm? Guardrails were approaching the bridge so that because the worst thing they would see is you get off the road and you bounce off the bridge and go out into the space and then drop down the creek. So that's why they have that guy rail wrap around. It's to prevent you from actually missing the bridge. Right, yeah, but the wrap the wrap around, around continues down. around 50 feet down uh, to 13. Yeah, DOT safety engineers are. Well, right here they just have they have an attached sidewalk on our new bridge, and you can now bicycle right adjacent to the bridge. It's the time the bridges were built and who the engineer was. They're all individual. That's the anyway, that's a problem. That that is a problem because it is because right now you have to ride on the bridge, and there's not an adequate width. Um, anyway, uh, this discussion here is kind of complicated because they seemingly don't recognize that uh, 32 is a bike route. Well, that's why we are doing this. Okay. Yeah. Because because um, given the, the proximity of the Walkill Valley Rail Trail, duplicate bike paths may here may not be necessary, which is. That's not exactly right. duplicate because they're, they're going different places. Yeah. You might as well say that, you know, uh, Huguenot Street is a duplicate road where in the F32 you could eliminate Huguenot Street because they're going to the same places. So why not eliminate one of them? <laughs> they don't. No. So that's why we're doing yep. this because as before with the, 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 the sentence that I cut out, which made no sense right. because the consultant doesn't nearly as familiar with this place right. as we are. That's why. Well, you know, that, that the caveat practice. at the beginning tells you all, although not within the scope, then eliminate this, you know, this whole okay. caveat. All right. Well, what I do want you to tell us, though, is what are the, the footages that are needed um, in order to do a complete streets approach? What are the footage requirements? Yes. Yeah, so it, it says totally. here. A 55-foot right-of-way for this area could include two six-foot sidewalks, right. two eight-inch wide on-street parking areas. Eight foot, areas, eight foot wide on-street parking. And two 12-foot lanes of traffic, 52 feet total. Um, but they're eliminating a safe bike lane. That's what I was thinking. That's exactly what this is suggesting. You know. So Again, and this is between Stewart's and broad view only. Because uh, they're only talking about the southern border. Right, district. right. So you're talking about from Mulberry, is that correct? 
Yeah. Yeah, but we want to do complete streets right. approach for the whole corridor. So the problem is so the what's the width when you hit when you go past Broadhead? Broadhead. Yeah. I mean that's a problem. It has a well there's historical use. Unfortunately, you're going to have to do a little bit of homework here to figure out exactly where is the property line because the original property lines of all those strips, the Huguenot, the original Huguenot distribution of those 12 slips is a little step work pattern and that the road became just through historical usage and then it became State Route 32 by de facto. Well, but got moved in the 50s. In the 50s, yeah, I know, but they never really legally acquired the land that the road is on. So I can't tell you for sure. I've started to do some research yeah. on this but because it's, it's like a little step work pattern. Each one of the Huguenot properties is this long strip that runs from the river. It has exactly the same amount, but as a curve with the river, they put a straight line here. So it's like this little step pattern. And there's no... Bacon strips. But bacon strips, but they're staggered. Yeah. So as far as what is the legal width, what does the state of New York own, they don't, it's just by some historical fiat. And I don't know what you can expect to do in terms of where, how you can accommodate the width or greater width of the, of the road. Even Mulberry Street is on the maps that I've looked at, it says, I think it's only 40 feet is the right of way maximum, which is less than, you know, you have to take a look at the maps, the but fit. yeah, it's, it's less than the required fee. If you talk to Chris Marks, he'll tell you, you know, well, this is the rule of thumb. Well, so sometimes the, you know, the street would be uh, transferred to the town through a legal agreement. Yes. Sometimes it's by use. It yes. depends on what period it all got created, basically. Right. Uh, they may have a right of way that's a lim you know, minimum right of way, whether they own it or not. Uh, I do also see in the existing code, it says zero setback except to accommodate the sidewalks. So maybe sidewalks don't need to be within the right of way. It could be an additional, so that gives us more room within the right of way to allow for the bike. So maybe we don't have to include sidewalks. And that's Sidewalk what they could be did do the, in zero place. They actually alienated like a foot and a half along the front of their parking lot and gave it to the state widen so that they could make sure the sidewalk stayed within the state's right away. They actually gave part of their property to the state. Well, their recent proposal, or most recent one, had parking and then a protected bike lane right. and then sidewalk, which is the way to go. Yeah, I know that. Uh, we need to have some kind of stuff that we can put into our uh, our recommendations that um, maybe you could help us with in terms of, uh, you know, diagramming and uh, sure exactly. Um, well, I mean, the idea that it's duplicate bike paths is sort of a, I don't know where they got that notion. I mean, we have duplicate roads then. I mean, isn't yeah. Du Bois just a duplicate yeah. of? I think what they're saying though is that as you continue on 32, it's not proper for a bike. It's really a shared road. That shared road roadway at after Broadhead. After, after Broadhead, Broadhead. Yeah. It's, it's a shared roadway. There right. is no bike lane. And so, you know, trying to marginal into that, I understand what he was trying to do. I, again, I don't necessarily agree. Um, but um, it's difficult, especially when I'm at a village ordinance and that's a state highway. And DOT will tell you what they're going to do in their state highway. So it, it's hard. It's hard. And yeah. how do we how do, how do we make a complete street scenario, which you know we are hopefully doing with zero place with that protected bike lane? How can we put that into the recommendations so that we can extend that further up the corridor? And then make further north. Yeah. It makes north. absolute sense to make it yeah. north because then it's access for commercial use by right. any bicyclists that are currently using it as a bike route. And then that could feed into Mulberry Street as being our link to the Empire State trail system, right? Yes. Hello. Right now that's what's happening on on uh, the on the boys is Chris Marx has, has started that first third and has 
lay down a bike lane clearly and then has to continue further on. In fact, he's going to restripe that. Well, that's the unfortunate part, though, is that he's got the two ends and not the middle. That's well, the middle is uh, substantial. It was in the budget for this year to be done and uh, to redo that middle because there's a lot of drainage work that has to be done. I was, was wondering supposed, if there's adequate right of way in there, and it seems pretty tight. He said there is. He said okay. the neighbors will be upset because they think it's theirs, take but it's not. Part of their front yard. For right. Drainage. Right. Well, for drainage pipes, and have to go under, it's going to be underground. So. So, my, again, my question is how can we put that into the zoning codes so that we make uh, provision for protected bike lanes if we're going to have. Um, on street parking, or are we going to abandon on street parking in the northern end of the NBR? Well, the northern end is where you would technically have more room to have a protected bike lane and parking. <laughs> you know, we run into a real conflict with sidewalks also because we had uh, we had the bike ped committee here and we had our police chief here, and the question came up about you know riding bicycles on the sidewalk. And, you know, he sort of really waffled on New York City, it's against the law. You cannot ride a bicycle on a sidewalk. But in New Paltz, in most of New York State, it's legal to ride a bicycle on the sidewalk. And he just said, well, was it the discretion of the officer, which is like... <laughs> I thought that was state vehicle law. No, it's left of local jurisdiction, oh, local, really? local ordinance. Who, who's well, required to yield sidewalk or That's like bicycles used to yield to pedestrians in all cases, yeah. And, um, and yeah, in fact, other states like Florida, in fact, New Jersey even has, where it says if a bicycle's on the sidewalk, they have to yield to, to pedestrians and they have to follow all pedestrian signals. So when they come to a stoplight, they have to stop, you know. Um, just as, you know, but if you're on a roadway, you can just cross. It's funny too because I mean, the sidewalks or the crosswalks. My understanding was always if you ride your bicycle across the crosswalk, you are not protected. If you get off and walk your bicycle, you are protected. Are you allowed to ride your bike in traffic while someone's crossing, or are you supposed to stop like cars? You have to. See. You have to stop. If you're on a bicycle, and that's the thing. If bicycle is supposed to follow the vehicle. That's also the weird thing about sidewalks is that bicycles are supposed to be on the same side as the car, whereas pedestrians are supposed to walk the opposite way. Yeah. Only if they're on the road. Yeah. yeah it's. It appears to be raining. I'm glad I left all the yeah. windows open at home. <laughs> <laughs> so you want help with number uh, 16? Yeah. So um, it. So, not right this minute. But okay. I. I need us to have an understanding of what the streetscape should look like from a complete streets point of view uh, point of view and how we can integrate that into the zoning or at least have something more than just complete streets hanging out there you know as a recommendation because people don't know what that means mm -hmm. right well having a protected bike lane would be a fantastic thing if you're going to have okay. storefronts along 32 because this adds another dimension of people to can use and see the stores and you know access them, um, and it eliminates the risk because people are more distracted when you're driving down and there are store windows and pedestrians and other things happening around. And there's lots of we got Stewart's those two things. We got Zero Place is going to have an exit right there. I mean, this is a you know a lot of things. Today, actually, I was at Stewart's and I watched a truck parked in the bus stop, blocking the bike lane, and the driver got out and he waited a long time to try to cross the street, you know, back and forth, back and forth. You know, same thing with, there's a lot of distractions right there at that little intersection. I don't know what the plan for signalizing that eventually is going to be, but that's going to be a key challenge for the, for the town because you've got that bike route coming across the boys is what's going to happen there when you get to yeah, that's gonna, two. That's, gonna, that's a critical juncture as we found out in so many of the discussions around um, Zero Plate. But it's, you know, a, a very 
it's going to be a dangerous intersection no matter what, what happens because there's going to be a lot of traffic focused there, pedestrian, bike, and automobile. And during peak, peak morning hours, it's like a thousand vehicles an hour. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of traffic goes through there. And that's right when you have people, you know, even in the summertime, wanting to go to Moriello Pool because they have those early swims that are crossing the street. So yeah. why, why, do the, why do the sidewalks have to be in the right of way? Why can't they be on the private property? I don't know the answer to that question. Because that you have to. Is that so that they're maintained, or no, I don't say maintained, but so that they're rebuilt when they need to be, and you don't put the onus on the uh, proper business owner? Well, the business owner or the property owner is responsible for maintaining for, the yeah, sidewalk. Yeah, like for clearing it and so on. But even not if like, they're in the right of way. Right, but what prevents, because even, because in the current zoning it says zero setback minimum uh, as needed to accommodate sidewalks. Or minimum as needed to accommodate sidewalks. So. The sidewalk could be part. Could be part of the property, not within, and then we can not have to worry about choking out the bike lanes. You know, if it's too narrow to include bike lanes, then it has to go on to the encroach onto the person's property. Well, it's also you know evenly, but you know, on each side. I don't think you would. It, well, I guess it depends yeah, on what you road think is. about. I mean, think about where the boys comes down, and then where Mul Mulberry comes up the other way, and. How would you deal with like on street parking in front of Village Pizza? That would be, you know, I think that would just create a nightmare in that, a further nightmare in that area of Guam. I mean, it's not even wide enough for the police streetscape. You know, I don't want to rule it out. I think it is the ideal that we would be shooting for, but when I stand there and I look at the road, I say, okay. Parking on either side and a bike lane in addition, I just happen. don't see how it fits. Okay. Yeah, but it should be thought into the design of the property for in the future. For future, absolutely. So that so that the person is set back enough to accommodate, not necessarily required to do those things, but you know, if the right of way is not wide enough, we should be requiring a certain setback to allow for when the state ever redoes that whole corridor that they can fit all that in there and that one building's not right up on the street and they can't, you know, it kills it for the whole corridor. Good point. I, you know, whether it's in the right of way or not, we should allow for a certain width that we all agree on, a certain width, and if, and if it's not wide enough at your property, then you gotta be back. You know, if it's six feet too narrow and you're, you gotta give up three on yours and the guy across the street's gotta give up three. Yeah, how, how do you? Well, it can be determined How do you make sure it also works for if you put a light in? That changes the intersection more, or you know, mm. roundabouts on the path, or maybe even worse. Actually, that was the earlier proposal from 2006, was to put in a roundabout there around at uh, Du Bois and 32. Well, if you notice, the property that was developed on the uh, north side of Du Bois and 32, there was actually that front area was left as a grass screen because they were thinking they were going to need a right turn lane at some point. So there's actually, if you notice, the property's got a little bit of a right. setback in that area, so if that right turn lane was ever needed, they would have room to get it yeah. in. Yeah, DOT calls it channelizing. If you're a bicycle, it's called cannibalizing <laughs> because you're the guy that's going to get hit because people are turning right so they're looking to their left. They don't. They don't even see the guy on the sidewalk coming. Anyway. Okay, so that's a certain challenge. The other question that I want your input on while we've got you here is the um, idea of access to the rail trail. Um, at the moment in the current NBR, um, there's a suggestion in there that properties should have access to the rail trail. Um, so that if businesses are located on the rail trail, they would want an access to the rail trail. And I don't know if that's something that you welcome or don't. 
Well, ask the uh, New York State Thruway Authority if they want a little more access on 87 for all the businesses that are between Newburgh and New Paltz and then New Paltz to Kingston. That's the same thing. You end up with 17 in New Jersey eventually, you know, because the usage of the rail trail is, you know, it's, it's, it is a route. It's recreational use. It's also transportation, active transportation. So people are bicyclists and runners, joggers, walkers use it on a regular basis, but once you start opening it up, I mean, like City of Kingston, where they're doing the Green Line stuff, you know, they're limiting the access to where there's street crossings, which is the logical place to have it. Um, you know, putting a bunch of people with their cell phones, uh, checking out the restaurant reviews, standing in the middle of the path, you have the Wall Street Market, which is... Wall Street Market actually is, um, is a classic bad example. Um, it's got all this so-called access, unless you're a person with a stroller, a person on a bicycle, unless you're handicapped. None of it is handicap compliant. You got three sets of steps, no railings. You know, if you try to build a house without a railing with more than two steps, you get the building inspector out there right away. It's got a, uh, I think it's like a 14 degree slope down from that. And the pebble strewn is the uh, sloped access that between the two businesses, right where the cheese store is and the, 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 the what you call it, the uh, antique place. But it's like, it's, I've seen people slip and fall right in that spot. So I mean, it's like, it's, to me, it's a bunch of liabilities and no HD or ADA compliant route from the rail trail. So then who's the access really for? Or how does it really work? The business owners aren't really too keen on having two doors to watch. In fact, you know, I mean, they'd like to have, you know, the balcony, which is use, but not have patrons walking out, walking out of the store with something and, you know, hightailing on the rail trail. So. Would it make sense to identify access points so that there's only like two or three? And, but how would we, how would we stick owners with that? Like you have to have the access point. Because it is a long stretch from yeah. yeah, it's a long I mean, stretch. Yeah. Right, it's like right. you need it. You, you do. You know, do you need it? Or so do suppose you, you know. But th then you have the the additional you have thing. People of, come through the woods. People are going to come through, but then you have the homeowners that live along. You know, they have a nice residential properties along Huguenot Street, and then you have you know people coming out of a bar at two in the morning onto the rail trail, even though it's technically not supposed to be open to use. That's what you have. So then. You create a noise factor, you know. I don't. And I think it changes the the whole what the rail trail yeah. is mainly used sure. for once you start opening it up to. And you have Mulberry uh, here. I, 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 I just assume that's what people want it because. I don't think I, so. Maybe because I'm thinking of the park and ride, and there's access there. And it wasn't Zero Place having access also, so I just thought it was something that... Well, they were asking for additional access, which doesn't make any sense because they're 50 feet from Mulberry Street. Right, right. So what's the point? I mean, you have, you have Mulberry Street, and then you have where Huguenot crosses at the park, at the, which call it, the, um, uh, the golf course, is one mile. So how far do you have to go. Do you have an access point in the middle somewhere or that's something to we be... Should, we should be clear in the code if it's one or the other. Yeah. Because it's going to be hodgepodge and then it's... Right. I think it would make sense to have one mid-block public access. The property, the property, we don't have any property there, so we'd have to get someone to give us Maybe somewhere near uh, tributary 13 would make sense since you can't. Well, build, I I would look at you can't build up against it. I look at the crossings between you know I think we've got plenty of you know Broadhead and Mulberry are close, and Zero Place is talking about two axes on that. So then the problem is south of that or north of that. Yeah, the next south access is not a the next access is, is Bosey's. What about uh, does this? Who owns Gateway? Is that a private industry or is that county? I think it's a, a private nonprofit. Yeah, okay. yeah Gateway. So say that would be an ideal. That seems to be like almost the half. What Gateway would be, be, and they might be someone who would be approachable. Right, 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 right. I, the other thing is, you got to remember we're going to need a bridge there because mm, of the stream. Mm -hmm. All those properties are cut off from the rail trail by the stream. Right. Mm. And I don't think we want a stream. We don't want a bridge on every property. No, we don't. Well, then you change the nature of, of the whole the experience. Of the rail trail, exactly. but that also 
those bridges all come out, all have to come out of the village side, and they're all going to come on to village property. So does the village want the liability of? You know, oh, right. Yes, you're right. Yes. Yeah. You know, you look at you look at Zero Places Bridge. It's a wooden bridge. It's up and down. It's not handicap accessible. At least it's not ADA. The one that bridge. To the, the old park and ride. The old, the old park and ride. Yeah, that that's one. not an ADA handicapped no. bridge. And then it's also wood where I tell you, it's real slick in the rain. Yeah. Or I, even I, if it's wet, it's real slick. I, I think it does make sense after you're hearing all this. I just assume people wanted access. I just had that in my head, access that. But I, it makes sense. Um, but if everyone's agreeable, it does seem to make sense. Maybe the midway point, we could identify that property or properties in the midway point. Or just say we'll work on an agreement with Gateway Industries. It seems to be the middle ground place. Is that going to sell and become a developed property anytime soon? Who knows? But Either we say no or, or at least have one. I, I think we have to think about also what it might turn into. I mean, if it, say, say we pick Gateway right. and then they sell and they become a uh, pub. A pub, right. A 24 no, no hour bar. Or a open. roller skating place. Yeah. No bars in the zone. So that's that's definitely. No bar. Okay. But, but what so about restaurants? Can they serve hour, beer and wine? It, up until midnight. Midnight. As long as but they have to have food too. That's the way they do it. Is is the you just have to keep the kitchen open. So by the way, McGillicuddy is a, a restaurant, not a bar. They have a condition to always require food. Right. Service. Well, what about Seven uh, Eleven? The They're South Beer restaurants. Yeah. That could be open. 24-7 mobile is, and that's right. one of the problems exactly. we have that's actually right So we can limit that. hours too in this district, which maybe we can We have yeah, someone who wants to develop a property right on the rail trail. Well, I think that's something that's a deli, important. 24 hour deli. Not because of the rail trip, but because of the residential properties on the backside, we should limit hours of operation. I, I, and I don't think that's addressed right now in the current code. No. no. So it, I think that is important to yeah. limit. And because I think that you, could you be can, because we always try to because everyone that came to the planning board always said they were a restaurant, even though they were a bar. And we tried to limit their hours of operation to o'clock. And it worked for a few, like Barnaby's. They agreed to it. Because if you're a restaurant, you don't mind closing right. at two. But I think maybe the hours of operation should be some, a little more stricter than two. You know, restaurant doesn't need to stay open after midnight. If they really so, are. So say I. So I'll say maybe. But because of the residential properties, I think certainly there needs to be that. Yeah. And, that's well, and, the, and the fact that the rail trail is dawn to dusk. Yeah. And it's, the rail trail is only legally accessed oh, so from dawn to right. dusk. Right, right. And it's also a mile from Mulberry to to Huguenot, or you know, right by the golf course. So we're not talking like people have to go a long distance yeah. to yeah. access well, the that's trail. That's what I'm thinking. Well, if they're walking, right. you do have to. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a I mean, I mean, it's not just people on bikes, it's also people walking. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, the idea that you didn't want to walk half a mile to get on a 26-mile rail trail. Yeah. Right. Like, I, I mean, I'm sort of you're having not, a you're complexity there. You're thinking of long-term, you know, you're thinking of long distance on the rail trail. The rail trail is also being used for local transportation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so... Short walks, like walking the dog around the block. And, you know... In a zoning part of parlance, which is one of the reasons I kind of had questions with the NBR. Normally, we consider that the, the normal human will not walk, walk farther than a quarter mile. Yeah. That's for anything. Well, actually, there's. That's the, the, it's a little different size than that. But what I'm telling that's you me. from a zoning perspective. Yeah, I know. A, a yeah. business and a. No, but, but historically, oh, yeah. the. the, the the More circumference like of all habitations right. from the Neolithic. We're, we're already do way out of the building. Score, by more than a quarter mm -hmm. mile. And you can do walk scores for you know access to transit. Mm -hmm. The walk score is based on a quarter mile um, being the the limiting factor. That's as far as people are usually prepared to walk. I think one should have a park within. A quarter mile as well. But, but you're trying to evolve people a little bit more towards this we're more pedestrian have, friendly, bike friendly environment. We were supposed to have a bench within like 500 feet of any parking lot. Mm -hmm. Just a place for people to rest because that's how far certain people can walk. But uh, I, I would say one 
act. I yeah. think we could work as the village, maybe not even part of this. In this, in the zoning, we're saying we're limiting access to the rail trail. The intent is to have one public access. At some point. One additional public access on the lane. Somewhere mid. Potentially mid gated or no? We can say, you know, open dawn to dusk, and then someone's got to go close it, but the rest of the rail trail isn't closed. I, yeah, I just. Yeah. There are no crossings. How can it be closed? Yeah. Mm. So, I, 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 I would. I want to talk to the police department a little bit and ask their, get their kind of a police commission yeah. input, you know, of how much additional access they want on a trail. I mean, because if you go to the northern, the southern end, I'm sorry, uh, and you're going from, uh, from right at uh, what, the end of Plains Road, then goes all the way to Old Fort. So there's quite a, you know, that's, a, that's an equivalent distance and there's no... Right. Additional access, but again, that's not. Yeah, but that's not at the high density corridor of the right. village right. development. You know, this is going to be the new high density corridor. So, and it already is pretty high density corridor. Okay, let's um, move on to number eight on the southern end, which is also a Walker Valley Rail Trail issue. Um, different um, setbacks. Eight says existing vegetation. Yes. Uh, this is page I got five. It. Uh, existing vegetation along the Walt Hill Valley Rail Trail should be preserved where possible in lieu of replacement with new plantings. Specific standards for the new screening between park areas and Walt Hill Valley Rail Trail adjacent historic neighborhoods should include attractive fencing and thick evergreen plantings to mitigate light, noise, debris. Where possible, the new plantings or screening should not e replace existing vegetation, but should augment it. How do you feel about that? Um, well, a pretty good. Uh, Christy DeBoer and myself are trying to organize a rail trail summit with all the owners because we have the town of Gardner, the, the village and town of New Paltz, and then the land trust owns this other huge section and that little piece is owned by Williams Lake and then trying to get some kind of agreement on how do we how do we deal with this kind of thing about access, you know. My feeling for people whose backyards are on the rail trail, you should be allowed to go to the rail trail. But I understand the village ordinance actually prohibits that on along Huguenot Street. You're not allowed to have access. So that's but you know, people personally accessing their backyard is not a problem. It's when we have parking lots and you know bars and or convenience stores that sell beer, and people just you know drifting onto the rail trail. I mean, I know people on Huguenot Street to see beer cans and things like that. Oh, so okay. trying to limit that usage as much as possible. And right here at Town and Country is another just sort of this hodgepodge of stuff, and behind the post office, and that's where litter, tunnel litter, it turns up. And that's when we have our annual cleanup. Most of the garbage comes from right there. Yep. Between, you know. It's also the only place we've ever had assault. We have what? Assaults. Assaults. With the Assault. post office? Yeah, it's always yeah. been like that down there since I was a kid. Mm. Shady um, area. So I'm, I'm asking for right. input oh, yeah. in terms of the recommendation of um, that screening and augmenting vegetation rather than replacing it. Is, is that a wording that that you feel is appropriate, and that's, I'm opening that up to other people too. How, how do you, when you have a three-story building, what, mm -hmm. are we requiring something mm -hmm. to some minimum height, or certain These caliber? These are the questions I'm every, Yeah, I mean, that's, because you're only gonna create something that, uh, maybe you don't see the cars, but once you get above the first story, there's nothing you can do unless you're putting mature, or trees that are right. there to grow. Higher. Right. Otherwise, you're only dealing with the bottom third. Right. This is on the rail trail yeah. side, I'm thinking now. Yeah. Um, so we need to have like a footage of a distance. And um, there have been suggestions to do a percentage of the lot in the northern area, but I don't think that works. So what well, we need to come up with, you know, a number or numbers yes. that would provide us with a greater setback on the Walk Hill Valley Rail Trail side than necessarily on the Route 32 side. I 
think we sort of came to that general agreement. What do you think about, it should be interesting to be able to relate it to the building height. Or that uses. makes a huge difference in the perspective you have of the buildings. You know, like one of the interests, one of the questions we have is zero places. And the building is 40 feet off the rail trail and 45 feet tall. Right, you could say minimum setback, say 20 feet, uh, greater based on the earth something related to the height related, of the building, yeah. up to the height of the building. Yeah. Minimum 20 up to the height of the building, so the planning board can say, all right, you're 40 foot, 35 foot building, we feel 35 feet more appropriate. And you can put parking in there, yeah, right. but not the building. So you're really creating a building envelope. And again, that gives us the ability in the form base zoning to kind of create those building envelopes right. so that we get a good distance from the road and a good distance from the trail. Right, we should be clear what is allowed within the setback and what is not allowed in the setback and what counts as lot coverage, what does not count as lot coverage. It's not clear in the code. Um, they did lump a lot of new things in, into what counts as lot coverage, village-wide, but when they did that, they didn't increase the amount of lot coverage you can have. So like, pretty much everyone is over-densified. Right. As far as, as, the, so anytime Lloyd's, you want to do something to your house. The recommendations there, I'd yeah. like people to look at those for our next meeting. Because there's for like counties? three pages of uh, actual diagrams um, in the, the end of the mm -hmm. Lloyd. Um, is that the dimensional standards or is that the? Yeah, they're the gateway standards. Yeah, the, this is the, the, actually the, right, I got that, is, the that is the. That is form-based zoning. That's what that is. You're creating, really, building envelope uh, associated amenities envelope, and then you know. So you have your parking to be so close to the lot line. Your building has to be so much. Right. Further. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. I'm not familiar with form-based. This new to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm used to word-based. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And having to, you know, right. it's like reading a book versus seeing a movie. You know? But it is yeah. an excellent idea, especially, I think, for the northern end. Because you can then kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to give you this space to put your building in. Here you can put your cars. This is your setback on the Walk Hill Valley Rail Trail yeah. side. This is where you have to be on the route. To. The thing is, then it clarifies so the clean. information yeah. for the developer, and the planning board. for the planning board, mm -hmm. and for the public. Yep. Rather than everything being, um, at the moment, it's like, show us something and we'll decide if we right. like it, which is not Fair. not nimble at all. The other advantage there is if you're going to do any of these uh, service roads or connections in between parking lots, all of a sudden, if everybody's kind of got their buildings in the same place, then you can make those connections sure. between parking lots. I love those connections. Whereas yeah. if one is up front and one is in back, how do you put a service road through? Right. So it, it does, I mean, it goes to a lot of the things that we're looking to do, I think, especially in the northern end. I mean, that, that southern end, I think, is really constrained. Yeah, that's where we have the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have reached the end of our time here, so I'd like a motion to, uh, next week we're going to continue doing this. We're going to, you know, circle back to the things we need to decide on. Uh, do a little homework and look at the um, Lloyd thing that I've supplied to you because um, we're going to use that as a sort of template um, to go forth. Do we know what Lloyd, you were, have you talked to anyone at Lloyd to know the background to this? Maybe they got it from a source also? Maybe we could look they at what they was basically Scenic Arts and gave a lot of help on it. Okay. Dyson paid for a lot of it because of the walkway. It'd be nice to see. It's because of the walkway how they arrived at it because we may want to diverge in some spots so at least, exactly. it, at least makes us think about certain things jeff right. anzavino from cena cuts and did a lot of cena cuts and yeah. yeah okay both sides the gypsy animal i'd like a motion to adjourn second 
I'll make that motion. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Do you want me to get back to you on any kind of uh, revision of number 16? It says, although not within the scope of the Yes, county. that's what I was hoping you would say. Okay, that's, yeah, I was actually was sort of typing it while you were talking before because I thought, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, so please, uh, any help you can give us because yeah. you're our bike fed expert and we really appreciate that. Yeah. So well, Christy and myself. I need everyone to vote to adjourn the oh. meeting. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you.